There's a distinctly green tinge to this week's programme. My guest is Caroline Lucas, the leader of the Green Party. She's the first person from that party to be elected to the House of Commons, where she's represented Brighton Pavilion since last year. Caroline, welcome. You've chosen as your great life another very prominent green politician, but not, not a British one. Who? Petra Kelly from Germany. I mean, for me, she was just one of the most inspiring women, most inspiring politicians. And it's been a, a wonderful opportunity, really, to prepare for this programme, going back over some of the things that she wrote and just remembering what an amazing person she was. Did you know her? I met her once. I mean, I was joining the Green Party back in 1986, so that's almost 25 years ago. And very soon after joining the party, I found out more about Petra Kelly, read more of her work. And she really was like this wonderful star burning brightly. She died in 1992 in mysterious and shocking circumstances, which we'll be discussing later. That was nearly 20 years ago, so she's been out of the headlines for a long time. But there was a time when she was really the international face of green politics. Absolutely. I mean, she was uh, often on the British media. She was really the person who summed up the, the green movement. She was instrumental in, in setting up the German Greens, which have been the, the most successful Green Party that we've seen. She was very much an internationalist in her approach, and so she travelled widely. She was often in Ireland if she wasn't in the UK, if she wasn't in the United States. She, she really was an ambassador, if you like, for green politics. By an amazing coincidence, we have in the studio a third Green Party leader, <laughs> Sarah Parkin. Or to be precise, not a leader, because at the time you, Sarah, were active in UK politics, the Green Party didn't hold with the idea of having no, leaders. Right. But you were one of their speakers, and you've written a biography, mm. The Life and Death of Petra Kelly. So welcome to the programme. Thank Did you. you know her? I knew her very well over a long period of time. The very first time I met her was in the late 70s and it's not commonly known but the Green Party in Germany, its manifesto was based on the UK one because with our electoral system the chances of I getting elected then were zero. I see. So, so we developed policy and gave them to her. Actually the development of green politics was uh, uh, just as advanced in Britain as Germany then it's just that our electoral system didn't didn't uh, Ab Absolutely. Yeah. Some people have called Petra the Joan of Arc of the green movement and and critics have compared her with Princess Diana charismatic beautiful just a trifle flaky. Is that fair? No, I don't think that's fair at all. She had a, an extraordinary life. She was born not long after the war. She experienced a lot of movement. She went to and lived in America, came back to Germany, and her parents seemed to move in the opposite direction. And she had a sister who died of cancer. So she had a very unstable background, if you like. Can I just pick up the issue of flaky? Because mm. that is the very last word I would ever use to Absolutely. describe Petra. I mean, she had a formidable intellect. She worked 110%. And I think she was deeply effective. Sarah said that despite all the difficulties and dislocations in her early life, she won through to become this determined person. I wonder whether partly it was because of them. Her father abandoned her at the age of seven. Her mother remarried an American. They mm. went, as you say, uh, Sarah, to live in America. Though she, she was always right. a German national, wasn't she? She was. I mean, her heart was very much in Germany and she was largely brought up by her beloved grandmother, Omi, who used to travel with her. And she always put an enormous store by family and close friends and she really was troubled by the fact that her family seemed to always be on a different continent to herself, so she never quite achieved that, which meant that her personal life was relatively unstable. She started as a fairly young woman being interested in American politics. Yes, she did her higher education in the American University in Washington, and at the extraordinary time, you know, when uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated, the death of Bobby Kennedy, she was in Prague during the Prague Spring. Things tend to happen to Petra and she would fold this all into her analysis of the way the world was. You're very different, uh, Caroline, in, in the sense that there's nothing or doesn't seem to be anything <laughs> kind of unstable or volcanic <laughs> ab about you. It's all quite measured. I think that what attracted me to green politics was the way in which actually it does involve some passion mm. in, in a way that green politics is a different kind of, of politics and Petra saw that very early on in the way that she saw 
the Green Party as part of a wider movement, that she saw it as embracing, for example, spiritual concerns in its broadest sense, as well as, you know, the kind of bread and butter of politics as we would see it. I mean, I came into politics primarily through the anti-nuclear movement. I was Mm. very active around protesting at the nuclear bases, travelling down to Greenham and so on. And what attracted me to Petra was that she was very much part of that movement too. I mean, her feeling about politics was not that it was something done by men in grey suits behind closed doors. Politics was was an affirmation of life. It was about what we all do from the moment we get up in the morning to the moment we go to bed at night. We might not call it politics, but in a sense, the decisions that we're making all have political implications, if you like. As you say, she too was drawn in, at least partly, through the anti-nuclear movement. This funny business, Sarah, perhaps you can explain it to me, with her half-sister, Grace, who died of cancer after radiotherapy and Petra Kelly has seemed to suggest that it was nuclear stuff that killed her sister and that's why she was initially um, drawn into the anti-nuclear movement. Here she is talking about her sister's death. I became very radicalised through the death of my sister. She died at the age of ten and a half and that death which was caused by cancer and also by radiation treatment made me question in 1970 the entire gamut of nuclear energy application and that has from that day on radicalised me to the effect that I began questioning why should a child, even one child, die of cancer. There is something a little irrational about this, isn't there? It doesn't seem very logical. I don't think it's entirely logical. You have to remember that Grace had a very rare and very virulent cancer of the eye, so there was a certain inevitability about it. And I think what really upset Petra, that she was on the wrong continent when Grace died. You know, she was upset, so she was looking for a rationale. I don't think I would make such a big connection with her anti-nuclear activity and and the death of her sister. I mean, the death of her sister obviously affected her hugely, and there is some suggestion as well that perhaps she felt some sense of guilt because she hadn't been there. She always... The boundaries between the personal Petra and the political Petra were always um, not, I was going to say fudge, they were sort of non-existence very often. (laughs) Absolutely. She she became accidentally pregnant and for obviously personal reasons decided to have an abortion. But here she is somehow managing to turn this into a matter of nuclear politics. She said, (laughs) could all the x-rays I've had over the last few years be an acceptable risk, that is, to the the fetus? Could my visits to various nuclear power plants have had further negative effects on my body? What is the concentration of radioactive particles in the fish, cereals and beef I eat? You don't really need to rationalise all that, do you? (laughs) No, but I think that's a really good example of this real interconnection between the the personal and the political. Because in those days, you know, we weren't so careful about radiation doses. She may have had passion, she may have had authenticity, but what was signally lacking seems to me to have been um, organisation, method. I don't think she was disorganised exactly. I mean, she she pulled in a massive amount of information from, from a huge number of places. She spoke to the top people in all of the different areas that she was active in. And yes, she could have certainly done with some, some secretaries and some more support in terms of, of, of literally physically organising her, her life. But I don't think her mind was confused in any way at all. And yes, she had mountains of paper and she had um, her telephone console all pre-dial coded to people all over the uh, world and she brought all this information in and so there was an appearance of chaos she had stacks of papers in her (laughs) office and in her home and all the rest of it but when you see her speeches this was really organized into a very very coherent whole we're we're looking at a obviously complex and if not irrational Mm. at least a partly non-rational character, aren't we? The the, the adjectives which get used about her are uh, contradictory, tiny, fragile, frail, anxious, unself-confident, looking for external validation, and and then uh, hugely energetic, hugely intense, Mm. hugely charismatic. It's a... Yeah, of course she inspired a great deal of animosity as well as inspiring a great deal of love and, and inspiration. I mean, she was so clear in what she thought that if you didn't agree with her, then you would find her probably quite threatening. But she was... I don't think she was irrational. I mean, one can hold contradictory views sometimes without being utterly irrational. Two things can be true. And and, and I would rather see her more as somebody who, who was able to live with those contradictions in a way that you know, it seems today that we, we, we need that. What, what Petra did is she had her sort of foundation values of non-violence, feminism, ecology, grassroots democracy, 
and everything that she did and said she measured against those mm. and so it wasn't always possible to be entirely consistent which used to upset her looking at the the personal side she had a string of relationships with much mm. older men mm. do you think sarah and caroline that in some sense she was looking to replace the father who had abandoned her when she was seven is this psychobabble um, I think to a degree it is. I mean, I knew Petra quite well through mm. a very large chunk of her life for probably about 20 years. And um, because some of those men were older, that is what people said. She's searching for somebody. But the truth is she actually found younger men quite boring. They didn't really have <laughs> anything. Uh, they didn't have anything to offer in terms of new information and knowledge. In 1980, Caroline, she met the man who became... Uh, one might think, the love of her life. Tell me a little bit about him. Well, this was Gert Bastian, a, a general from the army. Um, a general? Who, who, yeah, uh, a major general. A major general, yeah. who um, one would think would be the very last person one could imagine someone with Petra's views on non-violence could ever have, have ended up with. And so right from the very start, it's a, it's a mysterious relationship. I mean, he goes on to renounce some of the um, military beliefs that he'd held, that he begins to, to look again at how the military could perhaps be based on different principles. I never quite know how much he really renounced some of those beliefs and how much it was his infatuation with Petra that made him feel that it was a politically useful thing to do so that he could be closer to her. He was 24 years older than, mm. than her. And he'd been in the Hitler Youth, hadn't he, Sarah? Yes, um, I mean, I, I was not a Gert Bastian fan, really, from the first time I met him. He, he always struck me as somebody who was not believable. And when I researched his war career and what he did after, immediately after the war, he came through as somebody who denied knowing what the German army was doing on the Russian front, and it would have been impossible for somebody who's in position not to know. And after the war, he did not look to educate himself he just sort of played chess and passed time until it was okay to rejoin the army he was a man of low imagination and so he when he decided not he was he was novel you know not basing nuclear weapons on first strike weapons on german soil but he was a bit of an opportunist i didn't think i'd find myself defending him but he did actually as a general quit the army on the principle of first strike nuclear power didn't he he, he did, and that's certainly commendable. I just do think it, he is a very strange mm. character and trying to understand what it was that Petra found attractive. I mean, he was, by accounts, physically attractive as, a, as an older man, I think. She found him physically mm. attractive, that um, he was obviously deeply useful to her and, he, and made himself in, invaluable to her just in terms of being that constant support in her life. Mm. But it's a relationship which I think continues to mystify many people from the outside. And she got herself elected for the first time in 1983, the first politician, the first green politician in the world to be elected, Not was she? Not actually, because they, in Finland and Belgium, Greens were elected before Germany, but ah. you can't, they didn't hit the headlines, whereas the German Greens quite rightly did. And by a system, a list system, which uh, under which she would never have been elected in, in Britain. No, that's right. No, that's right. Because it's a double system. You yeah. vote for your constituency MP and then there's a party list so you can even up the Bundestag, the Parliament, so that it represents the proportion of votes. I love that system. Mm -hmm. I mean, forget... 27, I think, doesn't 27. 27. Yeah. I mean, I, I look at that sometimes with such envy, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Someone who's on their own there, the idea of having 26 colleagues would be extraordinarily helpful. Yes, well, I was going to say, I mean, uh, forgive me as a, as a Tory... <laughs> seem, seeming to be um, uh, too admiring of a green politician, but you, your achievements are actually greater than hers because you got yourself elected by the first past the post <laughs> system all, all on your own in almost impossible circumstances. It was a, a, an extraordinary moment, I must say, and it did feel like the culmination of so many people's work over so many years. Uh, this was really a collective effort, but it did feel, a, yeah, a pretty fantastic moment when it happened. Some people have, have called Petra Kelly anti-politics, and that there was a sort of anti-political strain mm. in the green political movement in, in Germany. That hasn't been the case in Britain, has it? It's interesting. She um, herself called the Green Party the anti-party party. <laughs> and I think, in a sense, was already tapping into a, a, a disillusionment with party politics, which is obviously much more rife today in Britain, perhaps even than it was in, in Germany back then. But I think when she talked of the anti-party party, what she meant was partly that 
the Green Party would be part of a much bigger movement outside Parliament and that it should never lose its extra parliamentary roots, if you like, and that it would also be a party that, when appropriate, would not shy away from taking non-violent direct action as well, that that was all part of that parliamentary process. And certainly that latter part, the, the non-violent direct action, is still part of, of, of the Green Party of, of, the, uh, of England and Wales today. I think we do like to see ourselves as part of that wider Green movement. I mean, the situation in Britain is so different because we've got such strong uh, non-government organisations, Friends of the Earth, Greenpeace, WWF, RSPCA, huge numbers of them, in a way that when the German Greens were starting, they simply didn't have. And so in a way, the Green Party acted as, as, as part of that wider movement, if you like, mm. in a way that's perhaps a little bit different here in the UK. I think the anti-party party sort of rhetoric was anti-organisation. And this was deeply frustrating to Petra because there was such disorganisation that it meant people who didn't really want to do green politics could disrupt it. She began to chafe against she some did of this. Indeed. But they had a rule, didn't they, initially, that you could only stand for two years, then you had to stand down. This was yes. all, I suppose, an attempt to stop the development of personality exactly. politics. And she refused to stand down. She did. It caused her an awful lot of trouble. You were yourself a casualty of this tension uh, Absolutely, yes. Uh, what happened? Well, the Green Party, once we had our eight, 1989 15% in the European elections and no seats because of the electoral system then, it elected 32 speakers, it wouldn't have leaders, and so that it was a really difficult time. And after a while I thought, I need to be able to work for what I believe in, Green politics, and actually at the way the party was then... I can do this much better so outside. So in a way, Caroline, you're kind of standing on Sarah's shoulders as well as... Uh... Oh, I would be the first to, mm. to admit that. I mean, Sarah's been a, a huge inspiration to me right from the start of, of, of my involvement in, in green politics. I remember I, I started off as the press officer, actually, for the party back in 87, at the time when Sarah was one of the speakers, and, and many a phone call was had when uh, Sarah was in Lyon at the time, and she would often tell me, but I'm up to my eyes in cleaning the house, and I was like, well, never mind, you've got to go to a TV studio, you've got to get there now. And uh, I think between us, we did help to, to professionalise the party a bit, certainly on, mm. the, on the media side. The Germans were split, the German Green, between the fundies, is that how it's pronounced? Right. The fundamentalists and the realos, the realists. The fundies wanted to keep their ideological purity as a non-party party. The realos were prepared to do deals, for example, to accept a moratorium on new nuclear power stations, even though that meant a tacit acceptance of the ones already built. Petra often saw herself as being outside this argument, but at other times she quite happily presented herself as a fundy. Here she is talking about that, that awkward balancing act. One half of the party looks toward being more established, being more acceptable, looks toward sharing power. And I belong to that other half, a very radical half, I still hope, which looks toward being a very strong and a very good, effective opposition, but in fact still being an anti-party party and not trying to sell short, trying to compromise principles, because I think there must be the need for a strong, principled opposition party and not one that will become weak, get more votes, but in fact give up all of its principles. This is BBC Radio 4, I'm Matthew Paris, and you're listening to Great Lives, where my guest, Caroline Lucas MP, has chosen the German Green politician Petra Kelly, and our expert witness is Sarah Parkin, also a former Green British politician, who wrote Kelly's biography. Reading some of what she's said and has written, violence and non-violence and hatred of violence seems to be a thread running through it. She almost sees the Green movement as a, a, a reaction to violence against the environment. Whence do you think this uh, preoccupation with violence came, Sarah? Well, when she was in America and studying, I mean, she read Thoreau and she read a lot of the sort of non-violent literature. And so she was convinced that proactive non-violent principles, using them as a sort of a, a, a route to peace was the way that we could resolve a lot of the problems we had in conflict and so on. She wasn't passive non-violent. It was very, very proactive application to everyday life. And this was sort of beyond quite a lot of people who hadn't had her sort of American mm. education, especially in Germany. In those days, we have to remember, this is quite a while ago now, Germany was stuck in the sort of post-war trying to make the Deutschmark make up for what happened, you know, respect for the Deutschmark make up for what happened in the uh, concentration camps. And this was 
just a, a very difficult pond, a political pond, to talk about non-violence. I, I wonder, Caroline, whether there's a little bit of an internal conflict here in that, from what one reads about her, she was, if not an aggressive personality, certainly completely front foot person. She could be very bossy, she would order people around, she was a commanding figure, and there is something a little bit aggressive about the persona that comes through. I wonder whether, <laughs> like, like, like those stressed people who <clears throat> resort to Zen Buddhism, it was actually something in herself that she was fighting. I don't know about that, to be honest. I mean, I think, of course, she was bossy and she was very assertive and she was impatient when people didn't see her point of view. Uh, but to me, that's that's very different from the absolutely, you know, heartfelt commitment that, for example, nuclear weapons were mm. were wrong, they were evil, they were doing violence to you know, the whole of humanity, potentially. She was a huge internationalist, but... but how was she seen in Germany? Within Germany, was she a drawer in of people to the cause or was she a polariser? She was both, I think, if you can imagine that. She did draw people in. I mean, she was the sort of person who thought differently on a larger stage. And then there was the internal bit of the Green Party and it was really the disorganisation of it, I think, was the thing that she was fighting more against. But that was framed in the Funde Rialo debate. Uh, can I just pick up one mm. thing, which, which was what I found remarkable on the occasion that I did meet her, which was the way in which she really genuinely cared about other people. You know, yes. when you were with her, you were made to feel as if you were the most important person in the room, if not in the country. And, you know, I was a, an aspiring yes, green councillor Mrs Thatcher in does that too, but well, it doesn't. <laughs> no, uh, but it's, it's, it's an amazing, charismatic force. And, mm. and it's not only when you just meet her when she was like that. So, as I say, I was an aspiring green councillor in, in, in Oxford and she was deeply concerned and interested to know what the issues were in Oxford, you know, which... You know, why would she really care? But she did. And similarly, it's not just when you were face to face with her. I mean, she kept up a correspondence with thousands and thousands of people who would write to her wanting her advice about something. And, and I know from myself, from just a tiny little perspective of that, you know, how many letters you get from people randomly, you know, mm. wanting to know your views about something. And she would try to reply to every single one and, of them. And yet within the office, her own office, she was, I've, I've heard her. A, a fairly, if not a disruptive force. She wouldn't come in very often, and she'd come in leaving little notes on people's desks telling them what was wrong with them. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think she had a period in her life where she really was under massive stress and should have had time off, which several of us advised her to do, and she didn't. But while her personal fame was growing, the Green Movement in Germany was running into difficulties, and she was becoming increasingly reliant on Gert. That's absolutely right, that unfortunately at that point the, the, the German Greeds were imploding, they were tearing each other apart. I mean, fortunately, they came out the other end, but certainly for a, a number of years it was immensely difficult, and she mm. in particular was the butt of much of the of the anger, and I think it's not surprising that she, she took herself away and, and, as you say, decided to come in at, in the evenings and, and put her post-it notes around and, and was less around to, uh, to, to be the, 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 the butt of that. Things then were beginning to go wrong mm. for her. Were they going wrong for her personally? How, how was the relationship? Well, everything was fine for with her. And I think this is really important to understanding what happened at the end. And this was a sort of a quest I was on because, I mean, I had postcards from her just a few days before she died and they were entirely positive and all the people who met her and saw her and spoke to her immediately before she died I think you'd better tell us what happened at the, uh, the end Well in the end Gert Bastian who was really fearful that his Stasi files would be open and reveal that he'd had a relationship with the East German police, the Stasi and how much that would cause Petra to hate him that reached a climax, and for him, I think, it was the last straw. And so he decided the only way out of this would be to shoot her and shoot himself afterwards. Oh, now, that's a matter of controversy, isn't it? That's your, mm. that's your view. No, it's not a matter of controversy. I was in the house, and the gun that he used makes a terrible mess. This is all very distasteful. And you could see the mess on the walls. There could not have been another person there. And it would have just been so out of character totally. <clears throat> if Petra had committed suicide. I mean, I know that there were stories that that was a suggestion, some kind of double suicide. But 
you know, I think one of the most compelling arguments against believing that was that Petra would never do anything without full mindfulness. And if she were going to do something as dramatic as taking her own life, she would make sure that everybody knew why. She wouldn't do an act like that without making sure that, you know, there were letters to everyone, there would have been editorials and newspapers. She would never have She would have used that. it in some she way. She would have printed would have a T-shirt and run the banner. <laughs> so I think that's absolutely You think it's just right. her enemies who've concocted this double suicide thing to end her life on a down? I think that many people felt enormously guilty mm. about the circumstances of her death, not just the fact that she was killed, but the fact that she lay without anyone knowing she was there for, for 19 days before they before One they day. found her. Yeah. She must have become a bit marginalised by then if, if a silence of 19 days from her wasn't noticed any longer. Well, they did travel a lot, so, I mean, it was quite normal for them to be away and nobody was quite sure, but it is horrifying to think that she could have lain for, for that period of time. And you saw the room, did you? I did. In what in circumstances? Well, I there was um, with her some of her staff, and they were clearing out the house. So that had all begun. So the forensic evidence was very clear, and I can affirm that with my own eyes. And as Caroline said, not for one minute would I believe that Petra was anything but walking life affirmation at mm -hmm. all times of her life, even the most difficult. To be honest, Caroline, I'm surprised that you chose. Petra Kelly. She seems to me to exemplify many of the faults and, and false trails and a lot of the, the self-indulgence that you in your own career have tried to avoid. Well, I hope I have tried to avoid those traits, but I would challenge the idea that she embodied those. I, I, I think we need to separate the real Petra from the Petra of, of the myths and the, the easy sort of images, if you like. And yes, she was a, a contradictory person, and inconsistent at times. But overall, actually, there wasn't a contradiction. She absolutely believed in non-violence, in feminism, in the importance of ecology and the environment. She made connections 25 years ago that are still so current. And she was one of the first people to be making some of those connections. You know, to me, she was deeply inspiring in the way that she combined her passion and her Understanding that politics was more than just what you do in the chambers of, of parliaments, but politics was but all of the of the movement and of the protest. She'd and never of the have won action. Brighton Pavilion. She'd never <laughs> have got thirty one percent of the vote. She no. wouldn't work in today's politics. But I, would you know, she? I, without Petra, I don't know that I would have won thirty one percent of the vote. I think we all of us owe her a much greater part in our own histories than perhaps people realise. My thanks to Caroline Lucas, MP, who chose the life of Petra Kelly, and to Kelly's biographer Sarah Parkin. Goodbye.